Hey everyone, it's John and today we're going to continue back on the Key Concepts video series where I take some IP written key concepts and break them down into a simple format to help supplement your textbooks. Okay, so in this video what we're going to be doing is looking at OSPF DRs and BDRs which are designated routers and backup designated routers. We're really going to examine why they need to be there, what they do and how they operate. Okay, doc. So with that said, let's kick on, let's do it. Okay, so to begin this demonstration we've got a topology here which is eight OSPF speaking routers on a common network. Okay, we're all on the 192.168.1.0 and router 1's 1.1, router 2's 1.2, router 3's 1.3, so on and so forth. So we're on this shared segment, okay? So what I want to do is just imagine that we did not have the concept of DR and BDR. So let's go to the drawing board, okay? Right, so let's say imagine we have a, a network connected here, okay, on this router here. Now, if we did not have a DR concept, what would happen was if this network went down, router 5 would send an update to let everyone know that this, this uh, network is no longer available. So this would flood out, okay, and go to all routers, which is perfectly fine, perfectly reasonable. It's what we want to do, so everyone knows. Okay. Now that's not the problem. The problem is what happens next. Okay. What happens next is that everyone repeats that pattern. So if we look at this one here, this one will also will try to update everyone. Okay. See that network's no longer available. I've found out this network's no longer available. I've found out this network's no longer available. All the way back here. And again, this process just repeats. This router will do the exact same thing. It's going to start telling everyone about this network. So effectively, we've got this really inefficient flooding of traffic across the network when really one update's enough. If we can just get the information to everyone, that's enough. We don't need everyone to tell everyone, okay? That's just completely inefficient. So how would we resolve this, okay? Okay, so let's just draw an analogy as to what just happened there. Let's imagine that we are a pupil in a classroom and we happen to notice that there's an error in the homework, okay? So maybe a typo or a misprint, but how would we let everyone know about that error to watch out for it? In this example here, what we've effectively done is went and told every individual student, okay, about the error, and the next student has went and told every single student again about the error, and the next student has done the same thing, and the next student has done the, the same thing until the entire class tells everyone in the entire class about the error. Not efficient at all. What we really should do is tell the teacher if we tell the teacher, the teacher will announce to the entire classroom and then everyone has updated information about the error. That is effectively what we're doing when we elect a DR. The DR is the designated router. We designate them to tell everyone about it. They act as the teacher in the classroom. So we tell the DR and the DR will flood out the information and everyone doesn't have to go through this recursive process of constantly updating every single router in the topology. Okay, doke. So I suppose the next logical question is, how do we determine the DR in this network? Who's going to be the teacher? Well, we're going to go with the router which has the highest configured priority. Now the default priority is one, and if they all stay at the defaults, then we go to the next tiebreaker, which is the highest router ID. The router IDs can be configured explicitly and manually, but if they haven't, then we'll go with the router with the highest loopback address. And if there are no loopback addresses configured, we'll go with the router with the highest active physical interface configured, and then that router will then be the DR, okay? Now, there are some caveats to that. I want you to read about your books because it depends on who's been up the longest can actually take precedence, but that is a general overview of how the election happens. So in this case, router eight down here, actually has the highest router ID because it's got a router ID of 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 All the priorities are the defaults and say for example one's got a 1111. So clearly this is the highest. So router 8 is now the DR, the designated router, but we'll also have something called a BDR in case the DR fails and that is the backup designated router. Same again, same process, the DR after that one, the highest one is going to be 7.7.7.7. .7 so router 7 is going to be the BDR, okay? So this is going to be the backup in case this one goes down and this one's going to take over the job. So let's just look at what happens. Now to understand how this works, we need to understand two multicast addresses. Let's go and look at them. The first one is 224.0.0.6 and 224.0.0.5. Now, 
224.0.0.6 will be listened to and processed by the DR and the BDR and 224.0.0.5 will be listened to and processed by all OSPF routers, okay? So how is this going to actually work when it comes to updating each other, okay? Well, let's look at the same example, but with a DR and a BDR, okay? Okay, so let's go to the example again. And this time, we've got a DR configured as well as a BDR. Same problem again, we've got a network here and we lose a connection, so R5 has to update everyone that that connection is no longer available. What it does is it sends the update to the multicast address of 224.0.0.6, which is only listened to and processed by the DR and the BDR, so effectively the only ones processing that are these two here. Now, whilst the BDR processes it, it doesn't respond. It basically sits and waiting passively in case the DR fails and it's ready to take over. So it's listening, but it doesn't do any response. So what happens next is, once that this update from 5 gets to the DR, the DR is going to send this update out to everyone at the address of 224.0.0.5, which is all OSPF routers. So every OSPF speaking router is going to listen for this address and process it. So now the update goes to everyone and now what's the net effect is that this network's down, this router has effectively told the teacher and kind of told the classroom assistant and the BDR but the teacher has now announced to the class that that network is down and everyone is updated and there is no excessive flood flooding of traffic throughout the network, okay? So that's the basic overview of that uh, process. We'll just clear that, go back here. Okay, now I know we actually haven't discussed the OSPF states yet, we're going to get to that in another video, but I think it's important to plant a flag here. Now what I want you to see here is, from the point of view of the DR, okay, let's look at the DR's neighbours. So enable show IP OSPF neighbours, you're going to see that we've got a full adjacency with every single neighbour, 1.1.1.1, full, 2.2.2.2, full, so on and so forth. The same is true of the BDR, let's look at that one. Okay, enable show IP OSPF. PF neighbor, exact same, full adjacency with all the routers in that segment, okay? But let's pick a DR other, okay? Let's look at number two, for example. Going to look a little bit different here. Show IP, oh, show IP OSPF neighbor, and you're going to see that we've only got a full adjacency with the BDR 7.7.7.7 and the DR 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Every other router stays in two-way state with each other and that's going to be important when we discuss the OSPF state. So I don't expect you to fully understand that yet, but when we get to the states, this might make more sense. But I want to plant a flag so you're aware of it, okay? So the next thing I want to do is, if you follow my Twitter account, I posted a challenge to identify where the, the DRs were in a particular topology. I'm going to pause the video and reveal the answer to that, okay? So hold tight, I'll be back in a second. Okay, now for the big reveal. The actual DRs are this one this one, this one, this one, and this one. And if you're confused by that, let me explain, okay? Now, the most common mistake I see is people go switch hunting. They basically look for switches and say there will be an election on this part of the network because there's a switch, and it might be seven because that's the highest. And there's a switch on this little segment here because this bit here, so we'll have an election, and 11 will be it, and it'll be 11 and seven. OSPF doesn't determine it that way. OSPF looks for the layer 2 encapsulation. So in the case, if it sees Ethernet or Frame Relay or something like that, it's going to have the DR and BDR election. If it's a point-to-point -point or HDLC, it will not have it. So in the case of this link here, this is Ethernet, so it's going to have an election. The highest one wins is going to be 2. This is also Ethernet, highest one wins, it will be 3. This is also Ethernet, highest one wins, 11. This part here is a serial connection, okay? So it's not going to hold an election on this part. But this section here, it will hold an election and uh, 12 will beat out 6. And this part here, 7, will be the highest. So that's how we get that, okay? Now, the reason why I IP addressed it this way is because I wanted to highlight that even though this really is point to point in the sense that a slash 31, there can only be two hosts and there's no broadcast address. So it's point to point strictly in terms of IP addressing, but OSPF doesn't look at it that way. It looks at the layer 2 encapsulation. So let's go... And if we just have a look here, 
and that a show IP OSPF neighbor. We can see that we actually do have a DR and number two is our DR. And again, if we go to this one here and we did the show IP OSPF neighbor, we see that one is our BDR and in the other segment, three is actually our DR. Now, if we go to this one down here and look at the serial link between 12, our connection with 12 will not have a DR because it's on a serial link. So show IP OSPF neighbor. Oh, if I can type that right. You'll see that the link with 12 doesn't have a DR because no election was held because of the layer 2 encapsulation. And we can actually see all the DRs because DRs generate type 2 LSAs and we'll get to that when we look at the LSA types. By doing the database and we can see it here. All these routers here, 2, 3, 11, 12 and 7, are all generating type 2 LSAs because they're DRs. Now, if we want to override that behavior, what we'd have to do is go into the interface and type this command. If we did int gig 0, 0 and did IP OSPF network type point to point. We change the adjacency and same again here. We did a int gig, int gig. IP OSPF network type point to point and that will resync the adjacency. Now if we go in we'll see that we do a show IP OSPF neighbor. We now don't have a DR election because I've actually overwritten that behavior even though the protocol is Ethernet. Okay so to summarize OSPF will utilize DRs to make the network more efficient is to stop the extraneous flooding of traffic throughout the network. It will elect a DR and a BDR on the basis of the highest priority. The default is one. If everyone has got a default of one, we'll go with the highest router ID. OSPF will use the multicast address of 224.0.0.6 and 224.0.0.5. It will generate, well, DRs will generate type 2 LSAs, which are network link LSAs, and DR elections will be held on the basis of the encapsulation type, and don't go switch hunting. Okie doke. So that's the end of the intro to DRs and BDRs. Thanks very much, and I'll see you guys soon.